We know Christmas is a busy time of year. There's a lot to do. But we also know it's time to celebrate the Incarnation. And looking back to the first coming of Christ can actually help us think about how to live our lives today in light of the future. Let's talk about that today. Hello, welcome to Clarity and Brevity. Today I'm joined by a special guest, Dr. Jonathan Gibson of Westminster Theological Seminary, where he teaches Old Testament. And today we have a chance to talk about his new devotional book, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, published with Crossway, which is a series of, of daily devotions preparing us for Christmas. So with that, Johnny, welcome to the show. And tell us a little bit about why you decided to write this devotional. Uh, it really came out of my own dissatisfaction with my own preparation for Christmas. I love Christmas. It's my favorite time of the year. I love getting ready for Christmas. The wreath on the door, the Christmas tree, the fire lit, the presents under the tree. Uh, but I always find myself rushing out on Christmas Eve to the Christmas carol service at church thinking, flip, I haven't actually thought much about this time of the season or what I'm about to go and meditate on in the incarnation of our Lord. And so I've always been wanting to prepare better for Christmas Eve, Christmas Day uh, as a time of worship. And so it's really come out of my own dissatisfaction with my preparation for the Christmas season, wanting something more orderly, something more mystery evoking, something more worshipful. And so that's what it's, that's the origin of this devotional. So this devotional goes through each day. It opens uh, with a meditation on the incarnation of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about some of those meditations. What is it about the incarnation that maybe as you put this book together and reflected on it, uh, what, is, what are some of the amazing mysteries of the incarnation that you're uh, taking to heart as you think through Christmas this year? Well, first of all, it is a mystery. Uh, the Apostle Paul calls it that. In uh, 1 Timothy 3.16, he speaks about the mystery of godliness, and then he has a number of little taglines to summarize the gospel. We might call them tweets today. Uh, and the first one is, uh, God manifested in the flesh. And for Paul, that's a mystery, that the eternal God, who is outside of time, should enter time and assume a human nature in the person of his son. And uh, that is the mystery. John 1, 14, um, the word became flesh and we beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only. Um, and so what I've done at the beginning of each day is find someone in church history who's tried to capture the mystery of the incarnation. And so it's basically thir uh, 40 meditations beginning each day it goes from 20th of November through to the 6th of January on Epiphany when the wise men came to greet Christ, um, first appearing of Christ to the Gentiles. So it's 40 meditations and they're all taken from someone in church history, uh, from early church fathers like Augustine or through to C.S. Lewis, who said, in our world, uh, a stable once had something in it was that was bigger than the whole world. And so it's just sometimes it's a short sentence, sometimes it's a paragraph. And it's just my way of sort of stimulating the mind to be in awe of the incarnation. And then it leads off into a day, into a, a short liturgy of worship. Including uh, hymns from the church history as well. Yes, so it starts with a call to worship connected to the coming of Christ, either from the Old Testament or the New. And uh, then there's an, there's an Advent hymn leading right up to Christmas. And then around Christmas, it, they become Christmas carols. You know, O Little Town of Bethlehem, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And then the hymns move towards being um, Epiphany hymns, the appearing of Christ, the star, and the wise men following the star, and the shepherds coming to see Christ. So the hymns sort of shift towards that. Uh, so that's the adoration element at the beginning of each day. Yeah. As you mentioned Epiphany in some of these, these rhythms, uh, maybe you can contextualize this for us in the history of Reformed worship. Is it common to uh, come to Christmas and have a separate season of, of, um, of worship uh, services? Uh, how does that fit with the history of the Reformed worship? Something else you've done some work on. Yeah, so, you know, Advent was uh, first observed <clears throat> from about, I think it's the 4th or 6th century. 
uh, as Christians were preparing for baptism. And then around, I think it was the fourth century, it became associated with Christmas. Um, and it was really a time to meditate on the first coming of Christ as we look to the second coming. And perhaps we'll talk about that a bit more. That often we think of Advent just about thinking about Christ's first coming, but really it was a time to think about his second coming in light of his first. The reformers during the Reformation, not all of them got rid of that tradition. They, a lot of them kept it. So the Swiss Reformed Church was Ulrich Zwingli and Heinrich Bullinger. They um, said it wasn't something you had to observe, but it was a helpful thing to observe. It was there with Zacharias or Sinus who helped pen the Heidelberg Catechism in the Palatinate Church. And interestingly, the Dutch Reformed Church, uh, when they met at the Synod of Dort, they codified in Articles 63 and 67 the keeping of Christmas, circumcision of Christ, um, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, Pentecost, Ascension Sunday, Pentecost Sunday. These were actually codified into the Dutch Reformed Church. Calvin took a bit more of a moderate approach. Um, he didn't want it to hold equal status to the Lord's Day, the weekly Lord's Day, and, and I would be the same as that. But he, uh, one on one occasion, broke off preaching Lectio Continua through the Bible, and for two, three months he preached on the Incarnation and the Nativity of our Lord around Christmas time. So, you know, even Calvin was willing to uh, observe it in some way. And today, uh, uh, apart from Reformed Presbyterian churches um, who, who don't observe it, and some Presbyterian churches, even in most Presbyterian churches, Christmas is observed at some level around Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. And I guess my point is, we all observe it, most of us do, so let's improve our observance of it and meditation at, on the Incarnation at that time. Mm. Well, why don't we re return to the term Advent? We've said it some, people have heard it, maybe our viewers know what it means, but uh, comment on what Advent means and maybe say a little more about what you said a, a moment ago about how the first Advent points us to the second Advent. And maybe even, maybe there's some hymns or, or some meditations that you could throw in there as well to illustrate. Yeah, so Advent comes from the Latin Adventus, which means coming, and it refers to the coming of our Lord um, in his first coming. Um, and the scriptures speak about the first coming of Christ in various ways. Uh, Galatians 4, 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So that's speaking about that first coming, the advent of Christ. Um, other New Testament passages speak about the appearing of Christ in that first coming um, uh, or the manifestation like 1 Timothy 3.16, God manifested in the flesh. So the New Testament will speak about the coming of Christ, the appearing of Christ, but then Christ himself spoke about his second coming, which theologically we term his parousia, which is another Greek term. And so there is the advent of Christ and the parousia of Christ. And again, the New Testament apostles and writers will speak of that as a second appearing. They'll speak about him appearing from heaven. And the, we are waiting for the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and so we've got two comings, two appearings, and they're connected. They're contrasted. The first coming is a humble coming even though he comes with angels singing. Actually, a lot of our Christmas carols convey that it was quite a secret, hidden coming. You know, um, uh, how silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So yes, the, the shepherds saw the angels singing, but there wasn't many other people who heard or knew what was happening. Certainly the people in the inn at the stable didn't know what was happening. So his first coming was very humble, it was very quiet, it was discreet, but his second coming will be glorious, it will be rapturous, it will be public, there won't be anybody who doesn't see it. And so my first meditation in the book by Cyril of Jerusalem is this beautiful paragraph where he contrasts the first and second comings of Christ. Um, one is humble, one is glorious. Um, and so I think connecting them we get to see the contrast but it's important to connect them they're both connected it's the i call it the bookends of the gospel christ comes in his incarnation 
he will return in glory. He was attended by animals in his first coming when he was first born. He will be attended by angels in glory at his second. Um, and they're both connected. He came the first time, and as he said just before he left, I'm coming again. And so Christmas, I think, or Advent, is a time to remember his first coming while we wait for his second coming. We, we wait in earnest for his second coming while we meditate in awe at his first coming. Yeah. Do you have any favorite Christmas hymns uh, in this light? Um, yes, there's... Um, I'm now thinking about how, the, how it begins, but not in that poor, lonely stable with the oxen standing by. We shall see him but in glory, um, set at God's right hand on high. And so it's connecting the first and second coming. And then, uh, um, uh, come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. That's actually a hymn about the second coming in light of the first and then O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, which is the title of this devotion, is also one that reflects on the first coming, but is, is actually speaking of the second coming. Uh, it's longing for Christ to return and rescue captive Israel, the church, uh, today. Yeah. So one final question. What's your view on presents? Should we be giving them? Should we not be giving them? What's the theological answer? <laughs> uh, I, 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 I like to give them. I think it's a nice practice, a tradition. It's not... A command of scripture but I think it's a nice cultural practice that the Christian gospel has influenced across the world and what we do in our home we don't talk about Santa coming they know about Father Christmas as a funny story coming down the chimney but we don't speak about any presents under the tree from Santa or Father Christmas but what we talk about with our children is we are giving each other presents because God gave his best present you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so we, we try to tell our three children at home with us, you know, God's the best gift giver. And Christmas is all about the best gift that was ever given. So yeah, Well said, yeah. yeah. So this would make a great Christmas present. However, it does start on November the 28th. So if you're interested in preparing for Advent this year, then you might consider looking at this a book. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Jonathan Gibson for joining me. And until next time, remember to keep it clear and focus on Christ. Mm -hmm.